Do you read Stephen King? Good news, there's a club for you, the Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights. Consequence Podcast Network. Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Wherever you're listening from today, I, I hope you're hitting the subscribe button and keeping up with this series as we do release interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over at Consequence of Sound. Would love to keep you up to date on all of those. Of course, you can subscribe at uh, Spotify, uh, iTunes, and Apple Podcast, as well as YouTube. That's more your speed as well. I'm Kyle Merritt. Today, my guest, Incubus. It's the 20th anniversary of the album Make Yourself, which they're going to be touring this summer. And so we're going to head back to 1999 to get the story about the album that changed their lives. It was a huge commercial breakthrough for the band, thanks to songs like Stellar and Pardon Me and, of course, Drive, which became its own mega hit. And with curious timing on that single, uh, Drive, as well, which Brandon will tell us about. We hear how the tour behind the previous record, Science, had a lot to do with how Make Yourself sounded, what dealing for fame was like, especially as a, as a you know fellas who just hit their 20s, using a band therapist going into that record, and how the songs are represented today, especially on this tour. Brandon says he wants to reintroduce this album to fans. We'll hear what that's about. As well as the new music. They've already premiered one song live with a music video. The official release is coming. A new record is on the way. And what's more, this is actually a two-part interview. Later on, I'm going to be talking with bassist Ben Kinney. He's got a unique take on the record as well, which you'll hear all about and why, if you're not already familiar with the band's timeline. But let's get started with part one right here. It's Kyle Meredith with Brandon Boyd of Incubus. Hey, Kyle, how are you? Uh, you guys got a show coming up here in Louisville later on in the year, which I'm, I'm really excited to, to catch that. Uh, looking forward to hearing what you guys are doing these days, because I know this tour is... Something's pretty special, but a lot of this revolves around the 20th anniversary of, of what's become this classic, fantastic record, Make Yourself. What's it been like looking back so yeah. far? It's been a trip. You know, it's something that I think probably would have glossed right over us in the band had our amazing listeners not reminded us of it. We, you know, we were reminded of other anniversaries like the 20th anniversary of Science, which was um, in uh, 2017. and we wouldn't have known about that either. I mean, it might have been like a passing thought, but like our hardcore listeners were, they, they just wanted to remind us, you know, this, this record meant so much to us and what are you guys doing to celebrate it and all these things. And so we kind of started to really check in with that. And it's been amazing to not only hear the stories from so many people about what, you know, make yourself and science and, and, and everything have had meant to them and still means to them really kind of uh, gave us the opportunity to check in with ourselves and with each other. And we've been on this kind of wild reminiscing roller coaster of sorts um, just in the band room. And we really felt like it was a, a great opportunity to celebrate that record and not only like, you know, celebrate celebrate it but that record was make yourself was such a, a wild turning point for us you know we'd been a band for since 1991 so you know almost 10 years we've been a band when that record came out but it still felt like we were kind of just figuring things out and when that record came out we it, when we were writing that record it really felt like the first time we were writing songs that were that were truly our own they were kind of we were filtering our influences a little bit more uh, effectively I think <laughs> we were mimicking less and really kind of coming into our own as as songwriters um, I know that's how it felt for me as a as a songwriter and a lyricist so yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be wild to go out and we're gonna we're gonna be playing so much of that record and on this fall tour and as, as well as um, everything that has come since then and, and right. as well as new material that we've been working on I mean it was inky it sounded like Incubus before and after that, you know, in, in that sort of dividing line there. But but it did sound like it started a, a new chapter. I've heard you say though that the tour behind Science had a lot to do with how Make Yourself came to sound the way it did because of of sounds that you were picking up on travel. Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's when it's happening, it's really difficult to distinguish why certain sounds and certain ideas and themes are emerging. So I, I, I'll just speak for myself. I learned a long time ago to not question so much what is coming forth creatively and just allow it to come forward. And you kind of piece it together as the last step in the process. You, you know, you become kind of a scientist at the very last step. But the actual influences and the, the whys and the where's and the what's have never really made sense to me until we were kind of many, many, many years uh, away from it. You know, so in retrospect, it, it, it appears that so much of, of what we were experiencing on tour with science ended up influencing the way that Make Yourself turned out. A lot of it was from uh, a heavy exposure. We toured in Europe and UK a lot mm -hmm. on science, and we were over there for sometimes months at a time, opening up for bands and playing festivals and stuff. And so just one thing in particular uh, among, you know, sort of pantheon of other influences was like drum and bass and jungle, which was coming out of UK, uh, UK underground. And we were on these festivals and we'd be like, you know, second or third on the bill. We'd be playing at like 11 in the morning or 12. You know? <laughs> and then we'd, we'd be at these festivals all day and just absorbing all of this music and all of us, you know, we're, we're, barely 20 years old, 21 years old. And so we're still, the veil is still really thin, you know, and, and all of this stuff is pouring in and all of us in the band were really taken by the power of, of like drum and bass music. And we saw a lot of live drum and bass music. And it was interesting because it hadn't really broke, it didn't really like crack over here in the States, more in an underground sense, but there are these amazing groups that were doing it. And we were, you know, so inspired by, it, we came back from, being on the road for almost two years with science and we started you know wanting to see what would happen if we if we created almost like a, a rock infusion into that but like basically like like take some of those rhythms and borrow some of those rhythms which are essentially like sped up jazz beats and then i don't know we just started like filtering it in and it was really fun and it felt really fresh and that, a lot of the songs on um make yourself nowhere fast pardon me like they have that kind of there's like in the verses we have this kind of drum and bass influence and it's still to this day i, I hear drum and bass music and it surprises me that it never it never you know caught over here in the states yeah, yeah and a lot of mainstream rock it was becoming heavier right at around 99. I mean, that was really starting to be an aggressive moment in rock. And it feels like you all went backwards. You went you went the other way. Like, you had been heavy, but suddenly you were introducing... I mean, you this album gave the genre depth. It, it gave it some grace. I don't... Is that is that part of what you're saying? Because there was something very masculine happen, and, and this record... I mean, it had a masculine quality to it, but there, there was something very... Uh, something else, uh, you know, coming in with it. I so appreciate that that acknowledgement because there definitely was a a turn towards like heavier more aggressive for lack of a better term almost more like uh macho faux masculine sounding right. stuff that became really popular in that time and you can never really predict or, or understand why music takes turns the way that it does the only thing that i think is really predictable about music is that it will constantly shift and morph and change so we did not identify with that really kind of like uh, macho super super heavy just for heavy sake sounding stuff even though like some of it was awesome for us as a band it, it felt like those bases were being covered and covered and covered you know what i mean like they, they, the uh, the other bands that were doing it were doing it really well and it didn't need any more help so it was it seemed almost intuitive to to point our ship in another direction for any number of reasons, not the least of which is that we just weren't identifying with that sound as much. And even though, you know, there are still very heavy, quote unquote, sounding moments on Make Yourself and, and on uh, subsequent records after that, I feel like the uh, something that we've always wanted to happen is for the heaviness to be something that was in moments aesthetically in the music, but thematically, maybe there could be moments that elicited depth right. and there is a heaviness in depth. So uh, that was the hope. And so I'm glad that you say that because that means that it, it, some pieces of that <laughs> were able to translate. Well, you definitely get that. I mean, Pardon Me and Stellar, I think, uh, you know, two big songs off that record, two big singles. But but those really play into what you're saying right there in, the, in that style. And obviously, you know, Drive itself is, I guess, more of a... Um, you know, if you'd been an 80s band, that would have been the power ballad, right? That's, that's what that would have uh, represented yeah. on, on the record. But... Uh, 
Yeah. That, and I'll say, you know, so that song comes out and and things go to a, it seems like it anyway, things go to a whole never, another level. I mean, for what success was building to that, Drive takes it over. How was dealing with fame at that point for you? Because I know you didn't like being called a rock star at the time. How was just kind of absorbing all of that? It was kind of a strange blessing that we had such a slow and relatively steady uh, ascent to that to those moments that we that we have had you know in in our our brief but but uh multiple moments in in the spotlight um we had already toured make yourself to death and we had two relatively successful singles like you said stellar and pardon me and then we were actually (laughs) essentially done touring the record and we came home and we were starting to formulate our next step and so we rented this big beautiful empty house in malibu and we moved into this house and we were already well on our way writing um, Morning View and Drive then became a single and then it became successful. So we were like home and kind of already in our in our minds and our spirits, like on to the next step. So in a way, it, that was a wild blessing because we didn't have the same pressures around it. Mm-hmm. It was almost like we were floating on a kind of inertia of sorts. And uh, that was a wild thing to experience, like a momentum that we had created. And then to come home and be sleeping in the same bed for a couple of months at a time and have something working the way that drive was working. It was a really, it was a really interesting confluence of, of all of the, the gears working the way that they're supposed to when they work. So it was like the record label was working correctly. We were doing what we were supposed to be doing, what we said we would do. And, you know, <laughs> that doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> the record business is chaotic if anything and so when when there are moments when it feels like it's working on its own inertia those those are rare and and very um appreciated <laughs> from a band point of view i know especially when i talk to a lot of artists who who have had success and, and big success especially off one song like that many times they're not able to enjoy it because they are out on the road they're, their heads down they're working every day they're doing all the things that you have to do to promote a record so you know that that is mm. interesting that you were kind of able it sounds like to uh to kind of set back and see it and and maybe even enjoy that yeah it, that's exactly it like it was it was unexpected and um we haven't we've had a couple of moments similar to it but drive you know being kind of the biggest crossover song that this band has ever had it was the the most that what you just described it was the it was the most like that that we've had in this band and it was fun it was actually really exciting because there was this thing over off way off to the left that was like blowing up and, and, and keeping us kind of in the spotlight but we were over here quietly in this big beautiful empty house like squatting in this house in Malibu writing our next record so it like it felt like there was this uh, once again this sort of burst of inertia that led us into what was the next single um I think it was Wish You Were Here right the first single off of Morning View it was it was was a really interesting and, and really fun that sometimes it's scary you know just because you never can anticipate how it's going to feel to have so many eyes on you at one time. There's not really a, a playbook for that experience. So uh, back to my original point, I, I, it's been a, it's been a strange blessing to have a slow, steady growth in this band because I don't know how anybody could deal with instant fame, instant recognition. And the truth is, is it, it actually destroys more people than it holds up. So the fact that we've had a sort of slow a slow burn in our career has been a blessing for sure. Well, and, it, and it sounds like you all made a lot of decisions, like thinking it through, because, I mean, is it true you all had a, a band therapist going into this record? There, for very, very briefly, we, we spoke to a band therapist. We were having, um, I suppose, uh, marital problems <laughs> with uh, some of the dynamics in the band. And, and some of that, I actually, I'm going to say almost all of it was present when we formed the band. You can and you can you can upscale this into a band or upscale it into like a family dynamic, but really fame and fortune only finances your neuroses. It does not <laughs> contrary to popular belief, becoming successful doesn't somehow magically erase the problems in your life or in your lives and a family. It merely finances them and sometimes like magnifies them. So we were in that experience where it was like our original kind of the original sins of our band were were being magnified because of the success. So we, we needed some uh, help. So we, I think we went twice. <laughs> and it, it didn't it didn't do much for our process. And, you know, 
that's just kind of what happens in, in any family dynamic. It's like there's going to be problems. Right. So, but we've one thing that we have experienced as a band, and we, we've gone through every possible situation that bands historically go through. Everything you've ever seen on the behind the musics and read and the and the tell alls and the exposés and everything. Every band goes through, you know, versions of those things. We've just, um, we've never wanted to advertise or highlight those elements of our band. Um, we, we've traditionally wanted it to be about the art that we're making and less about the kind of the tell-all expose, things like that. Not yet, you know what I mean? Maybe one day, maybe when we're 50. <laughs> Well, you know, pulling it a bit more into the present here, as as you, as you do go out on this tour, something stood out that you said that you wanted to reintroduce this album to the fans, and and that makes me think of in a new light. Uh, do, how do these songs? How are they represented today, uh, especially on this tour? You know, there are certain songs on the record that we have never stopped playing this whole time, and we've, you know, we've brought them through a dozen, some of them more than that iterations, uh, you know, of the original. And so and some of the ones we've been playing throughout this whole time, we're kind of winding them back to the album version, which is so interesting because in that sense, like we haven't played some of them in the original album version in many, many years. So we're kind of been doing that. and It's been really fun again to, to hear them the way that they're originally recorded. And then there's a bunch of songs that we really haven't touched over the past 10, 15 years. And we've been kind of knocking the dust off of those. So it'll be fun. We're, we're going to play quite a lot, if not all, of Make Yourself on this fall tour. And it's just been it's been really fun. You know, sometimes you leave a song alone for long enough and it becomes kind of new again um, for the band. But as well as that, you know, we've been writing a bunch of new music recently. We have a, a new single coming out in just a few weeks, I think. And we are just finishing up. We're just mixing um, a handful more with our friend Brendan O'Brien just yesterday, actually. And the new stuff is sounding really, really exciting and really fresh. And I'm excited to start playing those new ones as well. So we'll be playing... Old music, new music, and everything in between. I know one of those songs, and it might be the one you're talking about, Into the Summer has already made the set list a few times. Is that is that the song that's coming out? Yes. Uh, we've played it once live, and we played it at our little Troubadour show oh, right. um, about a month ago. <laughs> we made a music video for it, which is always interesting to make a music video in this day and age. I know people still make music videos, but like I can't help but remember the days when like we would we'd spend like a small fortune on making a music video, and uh, all of a sudden now... It, it, it feels like, like, how did we get away with spending that much money on music video? Because you can't tell the difference between, like, the $15,000 music video and the $300,000 music video. You just can't. <laughs> it's amazing. So, it, was, it was the 90s and the 2000s, I suppose. We were, it was a different time. But, uh, yeah, yeah, Into the Summer um, is the new single, and it's, it's I don't know, it, it's a kind of fun, weird, almost sort of, like, knowingly 80s-sounding track. Our band is lovingly schizophrenic in our uh, creative and aesthetic approach. Like we don't really have, there's no like bumper rails for us. We just sort of go wherever Muse is taking us that day. And sometimes it like strikes a chord and sometimes it kind of falls flat, but it's fun to not really be afraid of just doing it. You know what I mean? Oh, it's worked for you this far. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think you're doing okay. I think you've made the right yeah, choices. I so. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I look forward to the new music. And, and again, I can't wait to uh, to see the show. It's at the Louisville Palace here in, in town, November 15th. Uh, and it'll be exciting to have you all here. Brandon, this has been so much fun. Thank you uh, again. The Memory Lane trip with Make Yourself and, and the new stuff, too. Uh, I'll be there. I'll be at the show. So uh, I can't wait. Right on, man. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Brandon Boyd of Incubus and the 20th anniversary of Make Yourself. And as promised, part two. So I recorded these calls right around the same time, just a couple days after each other. Ben and I are going to talk about uh, what makes that record special, his own relationship to the album, and how the songs are going to be represented today, and especially on this year's tour. Speaking of that tour, the band's doing something really interesting with a, uh, a phone technology called Mix Halo, where you can listen to a different sound mix. The sound mix that the band actually hears while you're at the show. We get the details on that. And we'll also step into 2009. The band released a couple of songs behind the greatest hits, Monuments and Melodies, we hear a little bit about what it was like riding Blackheart Inertia and Midnight Swim. Ben's going to give us a story on that and his plans for new solo music in the future. This is part two. It's Ben Kinney of Incubus. Hey, Kyle. We're going to have Incubus here in town in Louisville later on in the year uh, behind this 
This is the. Uh, are, are you officially calling it the uh, the 20th anniversary of the Make Yourself album? Is that what it, it all is? Yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, we're not. We don't really want to to be too to lean too heavy on the nostalgia tip, but we do want to celebrate the record. I think it's um I think it's 20 years since it came out, and we're calling the tour 20 years of Make Yourself and Beyond. <laughs> right, right, right. Which you know it does allow for a lot of movement as to what you're doing on stage, and and especially also what we're talking about today here in the interview. So. Now, you know, Make Yourself was a really landmarkish record, and I do want to talk a bit about that. And I, I know, I don't know how easy it is because you weren't there for the recording of the record, but, you know, you, I figure since you've been living with these songs for, I don't know, well, over a decade <laughs> at this point, maybe you could offer some insight. Did you have a relationship with the album when it came out? Yeah, that was that record was the first time that I really become aware of Incubus. I'd seen the, the band's name in advertisements for like Ozfest and things like that. And I'd become an, aware of the name, but the first time that I heard the music was listening to the songs off of Make Yourself. And that's kind of my introduction to what the guys were doing back then. Yeah. So my relationship with that was like, this is what Incubus is. You know, this is the first, the first chance of kind of formulating that idea. And I was very busy back on the East Coast working on a lot of different projects and working with a lot of different people. So to have the con context of like that's what this band is is kind of is kind of a big deal. You know, you get that first moment to realize it in your head. It's interesting because when we look back on it now, I mean, it was a newly aggressive era for mainstream rock, but it felt like this album gave the genre depth and and some grace that uh, a lot of other records didn't have. I don't know. Since you've lived with those songs, do you, do you kind of get that sensation as well? Yeah, it's it, there's. There's definitely something extra, deeply extra about this album. There's there's the time period that it came out in and its peers and the other records that people were making that kind of inform the overall color of the time. But this record in particular, it, it shows a, a deeper sensitivity and also like an economy of motion, if I can say that. The band managed to, to get these feelings across with a very simple and kind of clean way. Economy of motion. I, I don't think I've ever heard that term before. I've heard a lot of different economies, but not with that one. That's a a really interesting way to put that. Yeah, it's kind of like just make every brush stroke count right. and not don't go overboard. No extra parts. So, you know, when you when you took the seat a few years after that, did you find that there was a way to put your own spin on these songs? Was that important to you? The songs on Make Yourself, actually, they, from from a bass playing perspective and coming in and learning it, those songs feel very complete to me. They feel the bass parts are, are kind of hard to change on those songs because they, they fit so well. And you can hear that the five guys are gelling. You can really feel that the five guys are connecting on a kind of communication level with the writing of the songs, the performance of the songs. So I don't really, I don't mess with those too much. I try to stay very true to what's on that record. I mean, everybody, everybody makes adjustments. I mean, we're all 40-something-year-old men now, so the, there's definitely a, a physical difference in doing the songs. But I think the meanings still hold up, and the vibes definitely still hold up. And you can kind of you can get kind of a better feeling as to what's special about those songs now that time, so much time has gone by, and they don't sound so common in compared comparison to what's on the radio right now you know so for this for this tour then i mean uh you know the 20th anniversary of it uh, and beyond do you single the record out in any way do you guys do you know uh you know more of it than the other stuff or is it just kind of still mixed in well we we kind of we want to leave it up to the night of and figure out what we're going to do night to night but we, we really hope to touch the whole record over the course of the tour and and represent the whole record at some point or another whether we play the song straight up or whether we we redo some of them or reimagine some of them that we still got weeks to figure that out and you know, we really want to make sure that we drain the record so to speak you know we get everything out of it on this tour you know brandon had put a quote that he he wanted to reintroduce the album to fans and that makes me think of, you know, in a new light somehow. And and I suppose that could be the trick of, of not, uh, you know, having a night that's dedicated completely to nostalgia. I mean, how do you take something like this and reintroduce something that we've heard so many times o over the course of two decades? You just make the judgment call. You let you let time be your your informant and you make the judgment calls. What's the, the, the important part of the song? You know, you listen, you play the song, you listen to it and you say, what, what is this about? What, now that it's 20 years later, what's the best part of this? And do we, do we keep it in its original package, start to finish? Or do we dance around that with what we've learned in the time from then to now? And you kind of just make each call for each song as close to the performance as you can, you know, and some of them will probably come out exactly as they were on the record because it just feels so complete 
at this point in time. And some of them might get changed around because we feel like we know a better way of doing it right now. You know, it's, it's all like that's the fun part about getting to do this is you have the, the chance to make those calls. I know you, you are offering fans a different way to, to literally hear it, and that's through uh, this thing called Mix Halo, which they can do at the, at the shows. W- what is that? Mix Halo is it's a project that Mikey came up with where he wanted to, to make it so that you could go to a concert and get the best sound possible and not have to bring anything or use anything extra curricular. Just show up and with an app on your smartphone, be able to plug in some solid headphones or in-ear monitors and listen to the highest quality mix coming straight off the desk. And it's something that he visualized and figured out all the, the back-end technological stuff because it ended up being really challenging to make it so there wasn't a delay, you know, with streaming the audio over the airwaves to, to your phones. And he got it all sorted out. So you can go to a show with some headphones and listen to not the sound echoing off the inside of the room or whatever the place you're in, but the actual mix coming off the, the, the board and hear the direct clean sound. And it's pretty amazing. It's interesting, you know, as we, in this recent, in this current age of, of technology, uh, how artists are, are grappling with what to do, because you obviously have one side, uh, the far end of the spectrum, you know, some artists are like, you're not allowed to bring your phone out at all. We don't want to see it. And and yet here you are saying, not only do we want it out, but stick some headphones in and bring your phone out. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, I, I appreciate both sides of it because I do, I started going to concerts in the, in the beginning of the 90s and we sat and watched the bands. And now I go to concerts and I see people and they're watching a screen that's two feet in front of their face and they're not really they're not looking around at the environment they're looking at it through their phones and it's kind of it's different you know it it, um i can definitely appreciate how we used to do it and i can also appreciate how people do it now too because you kind of are like making your own little movie about your life constantly so i mean it's all there's there's a million ways to do it a million ways to get it done to each his own right well i'm I'm interested to try this you know i also tried it when uh you two did their last tour where you could download the app and you could see something you know projected onto them through your phone too so so it's, it is really interesting what artists are, are doing. It's very creative, regardless of the, the whole thing. You know, it was, so as we talk about the uh, and beyond part of it, uh, there isn't a, there, it's not the only anniversary because I thought, well, 2009, Incubus actually had the release with the greatest hits with Monuments and Melodies, and there were two, um, there were two new songs on there, or two songs new to us anyway. And I thought, you know, I'd want to take the moment to, to kind of celebrate the 10th anniversary of that as well with Black Heart Inertia and, and Midnight Swim. What were those sessions like for you? Because what it looks like on paper, it was the first time back after everyone had split off for kind of like the first time. Everybody really had a break. You know, when I when I go into my memory about that time period, it doesn't there doesn't seem to be any break. <laughs> it all seems to have been flying by so fast, and so much was happening. There were so many moving pieces. And I remember we were just, if we weren't touring, we ended up recording. And I know there was, there was different stuff that happened where we weren't working, but it doesn't seem like there's a gap in it. It seemed like we were just grinding out music year after year. And we went in and did those songs and they both were fun and they both had their own unique kind of ways of coming about. And then we turned around and went back out on tour again. <laughs> and I don't know that that's just, it's, it's just the, uh, the process, the, the revolving wheel, you know? Well, uh, eventually there started being a little bit more time between albums. Uh, of course, the, mo- uh, the most recent ones only, you know, eight came out just two years ago. Uh, is it time for another one yet? I mean, you're kind of looking back and forward at the same time right now. I, I know there is a new song that you've been playing with, uh, with End of the Summer that just premiered. Is that leading to something else? Yeah, we've been, you know, we, we finally got our own studio uh, a little more than a year ago. And we, since we've been off the road, we've been making a schedule of getting together Monday through Friday and playing and either working on old songs or writing new songs or just just doing the damn thing every day we can. And we've written a bunch of new material and we've got a couple of songs recorded and we're going to record a couple more. And I don't really know exactly what we're going to do with them, (laughs) (laughs) But, but I do know that we... This is, you know, this is what we do and what we're we're excited about doing. So we'll figure it out one way or another. I, ha- I haven't actually heard into the summer since it just premiered live. Although I'm sure there's probably some some phone YouTube videos out there. What can you tell me about that song? I mean, it, uh, other than it seems like an obvious title to put out at this point in the calendar year. 
we got to do a lot of things that we love to do that we grew up listening to in the song. The song sounds very 80s, and we are children of the 80s, so it's kind of us living out a bunch of musical fantasies in the song. And it's just kind of a jam. It's not it's not overthought or too deep or too clever or anything. It's just a, a, a fun jam that we really dug playing and had a good time recording. And, I, I mean, you'll, you'll hear it soon. We did a video like a week ago. And the video, I just saw the edit of it last night. It looks pretty cool. It's all going to be released at some point in the future. New Incubus music. I'm happy about that, whenever it happens. Out- Me too. Yeah, outside of the band, I mean, are there any other solo records in the work? Is is that something you still work on? Yeah, I, I actually, I finished a solo record over the last few months. I, I wrapped up something I've been working on for a long time. And I'm just going to sit on that for a while, you know, and see when the right time is to put that out. And I'm going to start working on some some more stuff. And I really want to try to get together with different musician friends of mine and make songs because I feel like I feel like there's just not enough time, you know, not enough time to get everything done in a lifetime. And while all my friends are still here, I would like to solidify by making making music with them, you know. I look forward to hearing that, man. That sounds uh, really exciting. Well, we'll be here regardless whenever the music comes out, and, and uh, we'll especially be here when Incubus comes to town uh, November 15th at the Palace Theater uh, behind the behind this tour. Uh, ben, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Thank you for real. All right, man. Take care out there. We'll see you soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Ben Kenny of the band Incubus, and thanks again to Brandon Boyd. 20 years of Make Yourself. And new music, too, especially this uh, this new single called Into the Summer. And hey, before you get out of here, again, there's a subscribe button in front of you. I assure you that. Uh, you can uh, follow along wherever you get your favorite podcasts from, like iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or even YouTube. And I hope uh, while you're at any of those, uh, you give us a hello, leave a review, give it a rating, whatever you're inspired to do. After that, WFPK.org. That's where you'll find me doing a show every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. You'll also find some bonus episodes of this series over there. Consequenceofsound.net has your music and film news. You can also find me at Twitter at Kyle Meredith and Facebook slash Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.